<laughs> I'm excited to introduce Stephanie Kimu, who is an equity strategist, writer, and lecturer, working to make the NGO and philanthropic sectors more equitable and accessible for black women, femmes, and gender expansive folks. She has a decade-long career in African development and now supports philanthropic institutions in defining decolonization and implementing next generation equity initiatives. She is an inspire, aspiring Buddhist, cannabis enthusiast, and yogi. As Buddhism inspires her own life, she believes that INGOs can benefit from its practices to combat self-cherishing that allows them to think that they can make decisions on behalf of other human beings. In looking forward to this talk about decolonizing international development, please give a warm welcome to Stephanie Kimu. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, everybody. Okay, we're gonna go with a little bit of a reintroduction. I'm Stephanie, I am a March Aries, for those who are familiar. I'm a writer, I'm an educator. Before I had my baby, I taught international affairs at Georgetown. Um, I'm a philanthropic advisor, so I have my own consulting firm where I support, su support, support high net worth individuals and family foundations in spending their money. Um, I'm Buddhist adjacent because I still knock if you buck sometimes, but really inside I am a Buddhist. But sometimes I get a little angry, so it's adjacent, not fully Buddhist. I am very womanist. Who's here familiar with the term womanism? A few of us. So womanism for me means I show up because of black women. I'm here because of black women and femmes. I do my work because of black women and femmes. All of the resource mobilization I do with philanthropic institutions and in the NGO world is to ensure that resources become more accessible for black women, femmes, and gender expansive people. I'm a toddler mom, so I'm always tired, and I'm a cannabis enthusiast. So these are the things that I'm bringing to this presentation. This is my lens. This is my toddler. We were at, on Thanksgiving, we went to the museum. That's why I'm always tired. Um, and before we start, can y'all just jot down for a second, just take one minute. When you think of the term decolonizing international development, what is just a few words? You can even put one word. As a former professor, this is the test. No, I'm just kidding. This is what we'll refer back to at the end of the presentation. The term decolonization is a very sexy term, as most of you know. Um, I think a lot of you are probably very conscious people, so you've heard the term, you've heard it be attached to a lot of different things like decolonizing global health, education, health systems. Decolonization is an important term, and I want this presentation to be a reference point for each of you to use the term for yourselves in this work. I don't want you not to use decolonization, but I want you to use it in a meaningful way. And so hopefully we will get to that. And really I'm here to spur some skepticism, skepticism, excuse me, and epistemological skepticism is this robust questioning of everything you've learned. And so when we're in university and educational systems, we can often enter them and be okay with everything we're learning because we trust the institution, as you should trust Wellesley and all these institutions in the world. But I think there are always moments in your education where you can be skeptical. And you can say, the things I've been learning could be challenged. The knowledge that I'm producing is based on philosophies and ideologies, and I can challenge them. And I want this presentation to be a starting point for challenging everything that you're learning in university around international affairs, and especially around the term decolonization. And so I want to define decolonization for you today, but I also want to think through the term solidarity as the mechanism to decolonize, especially in global affairs. It'll, it'll 
crystallize as we move forward. So first, before we start talking about decolonization, I think we have to understand what colonization did to people. Um, I think we talk about colonization as a theory. We, talk, we think about it as something that happened a long time ago. We can disconnect from its impact, but colonization happened to human bodies. It happened to people. It happened to their minds. It happened to the way they eat. It happened to the way they clothe, clothe themselves, what they think of their hair, what they think of their skin, who they think is important and valuable, how they define intelligence. Colonization is an all-encompassing way to define something for someone else. And so this idea of Western colonization is my reference point, because I'm from Côte d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, and we were colonized by Europeans, French. And so when I think of colonization, I consider it a political economic phenomenon whereby Europeans' nations explored, conquered, settled, and exploited large areas of the world. And so this is a photo. Have, has anyone ever seen this photo before? These nondescript white men. They don't look familiar. They're beautiful faces. This was the Berlin Conference of 1884. Have y'all heard of the Berlin Conference? This is when may, maybe 18 European men and one European woman decided which parts of Africa they were going to take. And so there were the Portuguese, there were the French, there were the British, there were the Germans. They all came together very far away from the continent of Africa and decided, where do you want your colony to be? And I'll take this part and you take this part. And this really defines colonization, this idea that because we are European, more valuable, and because our we want to also spread white supremacy, um, we are going to ensure that we're making decisions on behalf of people very far away from us. We are going to decide on behalf of other people, black people, what's going to happen to them. And I don't want you to miss the connection between how international affair organizations work and how this meeting worked, because there is a connection. When you start your international affairs career, your global health, your global education careers, you're going to be sitting in a lot of rooms similar to this, where you're going to make decisions on a lot of people's health, education, their value systems, based on your institution's idea that they know more than the people who are on this faraway land. We're in 2024. Oh, 1884. How many years is that? 1884, 2024, anybody? 100? Over 100 years, I think. Almost 150 years later, this isn't that different. When we say we have colonial paradigms that guide how international affairs institutions work, this is what we mean by colonial paradigms. That in 1884, these individuals were able to define the lives, the entire lives of individuals so far away from them. And again, I can't stress this enough. We're talking about language. We're talking about beauty standards. We're talking about the food these individuals ate. We are talking about who they defined as valuable, inv unvaluable, invaluable. And so really hold on to this image because it's relevant. It'll be, it continues to be relevant today. And that image is rooted in what I call the myth of white supremacy. I think we often use white supremacy without the term myth in front of it because it's a delusion, right? White supremacy is a delusion that white people constitute the superior race and should therefore dominate society. So the Berlin Conference of 1884 and a lot of different conferences that were happening around colonization were rooted in white supremacy and rooted in this idea that we must dominate society because we are more valuable. And so also be really careful and clear as you start your 
careers on how white supremacy may be manifesting. And so let's dive into that. Um, this, this poem is called The White Man's Burden. Has anyone heard of it? And so I'll read a little bit of it. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your, so your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. So this was a poem written in 1899 by a man named, I didn't even write down his name, I think his name was Rudy, Ru, Ru, thank you, not Rudy. <laughs> I've shortened his name because he's unimportant. Um, so Rudy was say he wrote this poem and sent it to the United States president as this like, mantra almost as they were thinking about invading in, um, the Philippines in the late 1800s. And it was this call to say, it's okay for us to colonize and to be imperialist. It's okay, don't worry. Um, it's okay for us to be colonizing and to be imperialist because that's what white people have to do. It's our burden. Because we are so smart, and because everyone else in these developing countries, I call it formerly colonized nations, because it's more important to say they're colonized and they're developing. Because if there are metrics for poverty, they're probably tied to being colonized. Anywho, um, so think through that too. But these developing countries, to see them full of people who you can define as wild or half devil and half child and to see them and to infantilize these people in the Philippines because there's a burden that white people have to carry to improve all circumstances and all people around them. That's what we talk about again when we say colonial paradigms that still show up in international affairs today. I don't know who has started working in the international affairs sector, but you also probably have heard a lot of racist comments based on people's intel intellect, their ability to speak English being tied to how intelligent they are, their ability to be paid the same as somebody tied to what college they went to, and honestly, if that college was in the United States or Europe or not. There are so many ways we show people in international affairs, those who we, we sometimes called beneficiaries who actually were lucky enough to be supporting. There's so many ways we show them that we still believe that they are half devil and half child and that they are somebody who has to be improved. And so it's just so important to take this seriously and to not bypass the sometimes insidious ways that racism shows up. And I want to emphasize, and we're going to keep talking about this in the later slides, that colonization happened to people, and it's still happening to people. We are seeing it today. We've been seeing it since forever. And it's important for us to be really explicit about what we're seeing. And Frantz Fanon, who wrote The Wretched of the Earth, also continues to say that the reason colonization is still happening today is because colonizers are still fabricating their colonized subject. And he wrote this in probably the 60s. And it still holds true today. Those countries who have so much money and so much influence and so much authority over people of color and over people who may not be as powerful, may not speak English as well, may not have as much money, our ability to consistently fabricate their realities, meaning tell them who they are, tell them where they need to live, tell them what they need to take in, what they have to accept, that's a constant recolonization of the individuals that are around us. And so, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but I do want to be able to say to each of you, when you start your international development career, you have the power to recolonize. 
each of you in this room. You have the power to tell someone they're not smart enough through some of the things that you implement in your jobs. You have the power to tell someone they're not valuable enough, that the way they speak is not good enough. All of these metrics for goodness that are baked into international development, I argue, are really tied to colonial paradigms. And if you don't know the colonial paradigms, you're going to replicate them even with the best intentions. But we know intention and impact is not the same, right? And so I want to dive even deeper into the characteristics of colonization. Again, I want each of you to know this so you can understand how your future work may be perpetuating it. Characteristics of colonization globally is really wielding power and influence to control and to shape countries and people's outcomes. So politically, that looked like you know, governing the lives of colonized people through policies, laws, putting people in power who are aligned with the colonial agenda. There are so many ways that international relations organizations, philanthropists, rich people can, in, can recolonize political spaces. I think we see this a lot, and it's something that in the next slide we'll, we'll talk about actual examples, but political colonization continues to happen today. Economic colonization continues to happen today, the exploiting of natural resources for economic gain of the colonial power, harnessing taxes, debt modalities to further extract. I mentioned I'm from Côte d'Ivoire, and we have millions and millions and millions of dollars in taxes we still pay to the French every year even as an independent African nation, there are so many modalities to extract that still exist on the continent of Africa, in Southeast Asia, in, the, in um, Latin America that colonizers have implemented from the 1800s. And so <sighs> colonization is real. It's close to us. It's in 2024. Socially, culturally, enforcing norms that create a culture of indigenous inferiority. Colonization won't happen and can't happen if there was an indigenous inferiority, including the normalization of foreign food, dress, language, spiritual practices, which often contradict indigenous experiences. And so colonization is saying whatever you're bringing to the table is not enough, and you should do more. You should be more. You should look differently. You should speak differently. Your clothes aren't right. Your hair is not right. Your paper is not right. Your ideology isn't right. Your religion isn't right. Colonization really stripped everyone of their ability to be themselves. And I don't want colonization to seem overly complicated for each of you. That's really what it was um, and continues to be. And that looked like politically the governor general as the head of the British administration in India, even after independence. So having one of the most important people in India be completely tied to the British monarchy even after independence. Ensuring that policies that were happening in post-independence um, India still were governed by the British monarchy, ensuring that debt modalities were still going to be implementable, ensuring that key resources could still be accessible. Um, policies were important to colonization because they made everything very accessible. Economically, I think in a lot of you have probably heard about West, Southern, and Central Africa, the stripping of natural resources, the environmental impact of colonization is irreversible. We've killed a huge part of Mother Earth on the continent because of colonization. Diamonds, ivory, timber, oil, I mean, you name it. I think these have been so stripped from different parts of the world by colonizers and truly at the service of early modern state making. Colonizers were coming in and taking resources, people also, and ensuring that those were being funneled back to the, co the, the colony, the, the colonizer's country, and building that country up, building that empire up. And so socially, culturally, that looked like English as a tool of control for social indoctrination in Kenya, 
the premier language through Eurocentric education administration systems. I mean, you'll see this all across Africa today. It's very hard to say I'm going to be a West African woman who stays on the continent and is educated on the continent and still can achieve the same level of success or accessibility as somebody who went to school in the United States or somebody who speaks English in a certain way with a certain accent. I just want to say that the three modalities here that I'm talking about through in which colonization was implemented they're just three, but they're the three that I think are most important. They still happen today. They're devastating, and they can't be swept under the rug, which I think you'll see in international development. It's easier to do that than to address some of the impact that you know, neo-colonization is having today. And so I want, I saw this on, um, on Instagram, so I'm going to re read it really quick. But no one is pure in a colonized world. We all live by our contradictions. Working at Amazon and being disgusted by Amazon, being an artist and hating the art system, teaching at a university and wanting to tear it all down, studying freedom in college while you go fucking broke, deeper in debt, struggling to pay rent but displacing someone else, a Ford fellow who protests the Ford Foundation, oppressed but also contributing to other people's oppression? This is the entangled dystopia of our present. We can see contradictions as impediments and be consumed by frustration, ambivalence, and despair, or we can acknowledge and heighten them. Quiet forms of subversion, deep conversation, mobilizations, large and small, each act we take further undermines principles that sustain this system. I think this conversation is something that is going to contribute to decolonization. I think accepting that all of us are here in some way being impacted by colonization because in some ways we're not able to be our full selves. We're not able to say, I smoked weed this morning. I don't actually like this class. I don't actually want to do this work. This doesn't align with me. All of these contradictions we experience, we can lead back to the fact that we were each stripped of our ability to show up fully as ourselves. And that is not that different than the 1890s when a lot of black and brown women were asked to stri be stripped of everything about them and have that be replaced with colonial systems. I I just, I, I want each of you to understand how close we are to colonization and how much information is out there so we can start talking about it in a real way and not in a way that's like, let's decolonize the, the student center. It's like, we can use the word, but we can't use the word if we don't know what colonization did. Because colonization happened here in Wellesley. It probably has, you know, however long this institution has been here, every year it's impacted it. It has at Georgetown, it has at Princeton, and all the institutions I've spoken in. And I think it's important for y'all to stay connected with every way that colonization impacts every space you're in. So when we think about decolonization, I don't think, for me, I'm one small black girl in the world, but for me, decolonization is not just telling white people to leave the global south. It is not replacing teams of white people with local staff. It is not shutting down all INGOs led by white people. It is not stopping white folks from working in the global south. I think there are a lot of trolls online who want to say the idea of decolonization is kicking people out who have good intentions. Um, but decolonization could be understanding colonial histories and trauma. I, I heard a lot of you, or I guess all of you, have to go somewhere overseas this summer. Wherever you choose, I think it would be a missed opportunity, more irresponsible, not just a missed opportunity. I think it would be irresponsible for each of you to go to those places without understanding the colonial history of the place. You're going to Brazil, you're going to Singapore, you are going to Jordan, you are going to Senegal. I implore you to take a decolonized approach to your travels and understand what happened in those countries. 
were they part of the Berlin Conference? Who were their colonizers? What were the modalities for colonization in that country? Because um, you don't want to replicate that, right? You don't want to show up using the same hierarchies of language that happened in Kenya throughout their colonial history. And that happens today still. Um, decolonization could be dismantling racist development norms, which I think come straight from understanding the history. If you end up working in Kenya and you understand how language was used as a tool to divide and conquer, you're not going to work within an institution and make English the only language you're gonna accept work from people in the community, right? You're gonna have a connection. The more you know, the more you can impact some of the norms that you're seeing. Um, honoring locally rooted expertise. I think decolonization asks you who's not being spoken to in this instance. If we're working on reproductive justice in South Africa and there are no South Africans in their room, perhaps we can start there. Perhaps we can think about what is the locally rooted experience. There's a baby in here. Um, perhaps, the, <laughs> perhaps we can start with what are, who, who's not in the room and who are the locally rooted experts that should be here? Perhaps you could think, should I be here? Do I need to be here? Can I support in a different way from where I, where, wherever I'm from? Um, decolonization also asks for you to make space for holistic and genuine indigenous leadership. And sometimes that means not going. I know most people are not gonna tell you that, but sometimes that means that your body being brilliant Wellesley graduates, that might be disruptive. Because what you're bringing with you is, you know, your, yes, your brilliance, but you're also bringing with you the coded, ah, I'm trying to say this in a nice way. You're bringing with you the way that the United States defines success. And if you bring that with you sometimes, that's not helpful. You're being disrupted. You're disrupting a cycle just like those white men were disrupting a cycle um, in 1884. There were millions of people living their life and colonization disrupted it. You could replicate that too. Each of us has the power to replicate disruption in a bad way. I mean, there are places we gotta fuck shit up and disrupt, right? But then there are places where there is true like, movement building and indigenous interventions happening that when you show up, that's no longer the important thing. Um, and, and it's okay to say, I don't need to show up in this way. Um, we all have it, you know, I'm, yes, I'm a dark-skinned black woman from West Africa, but I also speak, in, I've practiced my English to sound like this. I have a lexicon of words that people find, in, you know, important and, and interesting. Um, I know how to conduct myself around white folks with power. I know what to say and don't. Trauma has allowed me to show up in this way. A lot of trauma. And that can be really disruptive when I'm in West Africa, because then I become this pillar for white supremacy success. And I can be the person, the consultant that gets all the work. So I don't work on the continent. I work in Washington, DC, because I know my presence, not I know, I've seen my presence be disruptive to African women in certain ways. So please consider that too. And so after this, I'm gonna send you my, it's a janky child, but I'm gonna send it to you. Uh, my decolonizing development presentation. It's about a 30 minute presentation where I go through what it means to dismantle the white gaze, to foster better partnerships, and to elevate local expertise. I think I didn't have time to show it now, but it'll dive a little deeper. It's a Zoom recording, so be kind. I'm an artist, I'm sensitive about my shit. Be kind to your girl. But it has all the important information in it. Um, and I think when you, when you consider colonization, you consider the modalities in which it happened in the countries you're interested in working, in the, way, in, in the ways you're interested in working. Um, I wanna offer the idea that you can simplify your definitions of decolonization by actually thinking about solidarity. Sometimes decolonization can feel big and there are actually a lot of fancy white men in the world who are gonna 
try to tell you whatever definition you have for decolonization is wrong. They've done it to me on Reddit. And um, I think without pontificating too much and arguing too much on the definition of decolonization, actually what my reverse UNO card is, is actually solidarity. That's what we're talking about. And so I wanna dive into that to make decolonization, decolonization feel a little bit more accessible. And so I'd like to read this quote um, from Lilla Watson, who's an indigenous Australian activist. And she said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And that, for me, really defines solidarity. It's when you look at me, you find some type of kinship because the words I've used, the way I conduct myself, the love I show has created a soft space between us where now we can be free together. When I come into this space and I tell y'all I'm a yogi and I'm a cannabis enthusiast, I'm tired of shit because of my toddler, I'm trying to create a soft space for us to be together. And that's what solidarity is. And there are ways that we can do that um, on the ground and in this work. I think solidarity-centered programming, when you think about, okay, solidarity could mean I am trying to create a, a, a liberating space for the community I'm working with or for the person I'm in front of. Um, I want this community or this person I'm in front of to look at me or look at the institution I'm coming from and feel safe. They, re they realize that the way this institution is working, they could feel safe within it. Some institutions people don't look at and feel safe are the United Nations, the State Department, these huge global conglomerates that don't have a lot of time to create solidarity, right? They have, a, they have time to measure. They have time to implement, to prototype, to hack, to try new things, but there are very few people in the sector each of you wants to work with that, work, that tries to build solidarity. And I think that if we can take that and bring it into a program, like uh, international relations program lens, I think that could be rethinking an institution's relationship to spaciousness, welcoming new flexible practices, exploring innovative models um, to shift resources and, and to empower people to make their own decisions. I think when we join certain institutions with they often, and they've been around for a long time in international development, the Bretton Woods institutions and things like that, the WHO, they have so many rules that exist now that are not flexible, that don't give room to, for someone to say, hey, this doesn't work for me, this language doesn't work for me. I mean, even y'all in here, I think even within the Albright Institute, there are parameters that may not be spacious for you. You feel confined, every sector, Every domain has an issue with intersectionality, has an issue with spaciousness. We all want to create parameters to ensure we get the same results, the best results. And I, is this going up? No, okay. Sorry, I thought I heard a noise. And I argue that that's wrong. I think the future of international relations and the future of international development is space. It's spaciousness, it's the ability for us to say, we have a mission, but we're not tied to the path of getting there. If, the, if I, as a professor, want you to work overseas and learn something, that's what I want for you, but I don't, I'm not attached to the pathway of you getting there. That's what I would like to see for international development and international relations. And honestly, in, in educational institutions also. Can we create flexibility, spaciousness, new innovative models? Can we think about shifting power back to the people who say that they're you know, ready to work in service of their communities? Solidarity is acknowledging that everyone has wisdom to solve problems and providing resources for them to do so. 
So I think some of you might go into philanthropy, you might go into grant making, you might go into institutions that give money out. I think this is important um, for you to think about when you enter those institutions, you'll have a lot of parameters for who's smart, who's valuable, who should get the money, who should be normalized as the experts. And I, I argue and I, I want to challenge each of you to, and plant the seed in your mind that what if every single person in this world has what it takes to solve their own powers and uh, problems and maybe all they need is the resource. They might not need any of you in here. They might need your institution's money, maybe your institution's resources. But some of you, a lot of movements that are happening on the ground don't need any of us in, in this room sometimes. And we have to be OK with moving out of the way so those who are the problem solvers can do their work. Reducing your own presence, your own definitions or interventions to avoid unintended consequences. Um, I only have 10 more minutes, so I have to breeze through this, but this is going to come through in my, um, my doula analogy that's coming up. But you cannot burden someone with your own definitions and think that they're going to feel liberated to find their own solutions. Um, and interrogating, constantly interrogating the elephant in the room in international development, which is why is all the money in North America and Europe um, and why is all the power in centralized in those areas when the people that we seek to serve don't live there? Constantly interrogate it. If it, if it feels wrong, <laughs> if it feels right, I guess continue. But if it feels wrong to you, constantly interrogate that. And so I think solidarity is about being inclusive, supportive, and liberating. Meaning I'm not going to stand in the way of anyone's pathway of, ch of choice. When you work in international development, a lot of institutions are going to pay you to strip people of their choices. Absolutely. And you're going to hate to see it, and you're going to have to speak up in those, in those instances. And so the personal example I wanted to share where solidarity kind of crystallized for me is in 2019, I did my doula training. And a doula is a non-medical birth worker who supports birthing people and having their babies. And it changed my, it changed my life. Um, I, I thought of a few doula principles that I wanted to share with you. The first one that I think can root yourselves in solidarity is you can only make a positive impact if you follow, not lead. So if you are a doula and you're coming into a space and the birthing person is squatting on the floor trying to get the baby out and you say, that's wrong. You should not be trying to birth like that. You look silly as shit, and I think you need to stand up and try to birth in this other way. Um, you're not following their lead, are you? They're already in the goddamn process of doing their hard work, and you're coming in and disrupting them. You should not make freedom of choice harder for those you serve. So if you're a doula and you're coming into a space, a birthing, birthing person space, and they're trying to understand what the doctor is telling them, and you, and the doctor comes to you and says, you know what, your client's not really understanding me. Can you tell them that I'm trying to say this? And you decide, she doesn't need to, that person don't need to know that. I'm not going to tell them. You're literally stripping them of the information they need to make decisions for their life, life or death. It happens all the time in international development. Y you will be tasked with making someone's choice harder sometimes because it's more important for you as an international development practitioner to move your institution's mission ahead than to think about often the freedom of choice of the person who's benefiting from it. And so think about that. Am I making freedom of choice harder for this person? You should not limit other people's experiences with your own definitions and perspectives. When I was having my baby, one of the doulas I interviewed said to me, um, are you going to have a natural birth? And I was like, what is a natural birth? That's why I started getting heated. That's why I said Buddhist adjacent, not really Buddhist. And they were like, well, without an epidural. And I was like, oh, yeah, fuck this. Like, you're not about to tell me that the only 
way I can birth naturally is without an epidural. I ended up having a cesarean, so by her definition, that was un very unnatural. But I knew I couldn't be with a doula who could make that definition for me. And that is so important in international development. And that is so important in, in even trying to be in solidarity with everyone. Even if your institution or who you work for is telling you the definition of success is this, and you know that doesn't equate to success for the community that you say you love, because don't go into it if you don't love that community, right? You, the community you say you love is like that version of success doesn't actually align you're not doing anything but harm. And so it's really important not to limit your own experiences and your own definition, not to limit others with your own experiences and your own definitions, because that's harmful. Um, you should always provide as much information for autonomous decision making. And you should be really grateful and humble that you're supporting this community. Um, every time I've supported someone a birthing person, it feels like they're inviting me into the most, they are, they're inviting me into the most vulnerable, painful, scary, confusing time in their lives, and how the fuck could I come in there and tell them what to do? How the fuck could I come in there and tell them how to define anything? I am grateful because, as I say in the last point, the baby's going to come out with or without me. These people are going to birth their movements, they're going to do their, their environmental justice projects. They are going to save the individuals who are imprisoned unfairly. They are going to move mountains with or without you, me, Nina, anybody in this, this campus. None of us are that important. We're not that important. We're not, because we're not there. We're not with these communities. We don't live there. We don't know them. We don't know what they struggle with every day. We care and we love them, but the baby's gonna get birth with or without you. You can be a doula. You can come in and provide support. You can give them more information so they can make their best decisions, but you can't birth the baby, can you? You can't take that on for them. And so I really need y'all to if there's any, just forget everything else. Just remember this slide. This is the most important thing. This is why I flew here this morning from DC, is to tell each of you, you, you are so brilliant, each of you. Y'all are so important, but not more important than a lot of the individuals you will come in contact with in this work. Questions, comments, interrogations. Yes, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Was that over? Okay, thank you. Yes, um, questions, comments, interrogations. How are y'all feeling? You can boo your girl if you want. Um, yeah, and if actually, yeah, if we have some questions, I'd love to take them, but I have a, a reflection prompt for y'all also. Thank you, Elle. Yes. Hi. So thank you for the lunch. It was great. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Um, and also for your presentation now. So I'm just wondering, so I was born in the Dominican Republic, but I came to New York City when I was seven, so I basically grew up here. Um, and I think for the past few years, I've considered going back to the DR and working there and like you know helping women because I'm really interested in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, how did you come to the conclusion or to the fact, I guess, that sometimes it's better not to go back and to not insert yourself into that space because I feel like that's something that I still struggle with. Mm. So how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, I was told. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. Black women are very clear with me. So when I, you know, I, I, when I started my consulting business, my first client were the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And when you have a client like that, just doors open for you. It doesn't matter if you're talented or not. Um, and when I started going back for my client, I realized then that white supremacy doesn't need white people, right? <laughs> you can carry white supremacy with you. You can carry white wealth with you. And I was told by, um, I was going back, back and forth to Burkina Faso, Senegal, and Benin, and I asked, <laughs> and I was told. 
and is it's this 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 Buddhist um, rule that when you're a Dharma teacher, when you're a Buddhist teacher, you do not teach unless you're asked. Like, and that's that's what my life's about is I need to be asked to enter a space, um, and that's when I realize I carry these metrics of success tied to white supremacy into these Francophone African spaces. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't oblivious to it. You know, when you're a black woman coming from America and you're going into you know, African spaces, people treat you differently. You, 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 there's discomfort, I'm sure, that you un know what I mean. And so I started asking and they, I got real answers, and that's the solidarity piece. It's like you kind of have to be ready to hear that. I could, all, I could have not asked. <laughs> I'd have less friends, and um, my career would be different, but I think you'll feel <laughs> the discomfort. I think people will be real with you if you ask, and then you make a, a decision. Um, and when I go to Cote d'Ivoire and when I go back home, it's for different reasons and it's not for work and that's just a personal choice. Yeah, thank you so much. Questions, concerns, yeah. Um, earlier in your, uh, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, your you. perspective is really, really helpful. Um, Earlier in the presentation, you shared a quote with us. Um, I forget the person who said it, but mm -hmm. um, in there was this message that colonization continues now because colonizers are still creating colonized people. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I guess part of that is kind of like what you were just talking about, about the standards that we have for ourselves mm -hmm. and the way that we live in... Um, like Western nations now, and also, I guess, in colonized nations as well. Like, mm -hmm. when we move through the world now, living with those same standards for success, um, mm -hmm. ways of living, I guess we're also creating, uh, like, creating ourselves as colonized people. Mm -hmm. So in this world where we move forward um, without colonization, how do we, like, reconcile with the fact that we are also perpetuating it as people who were colonized and I know, yeah. yeah like where where do we sit as people who are now in western worlds who are perpetuating colonization ourselves just by existing damn what a question oh that's a therapy question child <laughs> i mean what you said was so profound and i don't know maybe you should write about it this idea that you know where are you from or where are your origins is it okay yeah, and it's this idea that we are constantly recolonizing ourselves through the attainment of certain successes. That really touched me, and I don't know where to go from there. That's a, that's a deep statement. I think it's little moments of activism. I think, you know, th this for me is... Um, this is my activism, right? I think I'm not really supposed to show up and tell y'all I smoke weed every day, right? But it's like, that's my truth. And that's a decolonized approach to this lecture, right? Is to tell you, this, these are the things that, this is who I am. And I hope you can see something in me that makes you feel comfortable. I think that's a decolonized interaction. That's very micro compared to the fact that, you know, I have my degrees from white supremacist institutions. Uh, Melinda Gates pays me. Uh, I got a lot of contradictions. And that's what I'm trying to work through, you know? And I stand in solidarity with you as you try to work through them because it's so disorienting. I'd say 90% of my income comes from billionaires who are not great people. <laughs> And, don't, and they don't fucking know me either that well, you know? So it's like this very transactional relationship that's very colonized, and I'm, I'm in it still. But then it's, there are other parts of my life where I, f I, I feel more empowered, not more empowered, I hate the word empowered, I feel more confident to do stuff like this and to be real. And maybe, may, maybe it's on an interpersonal level, 
maybe. But I don't know. What I'm saying is I don't know. And I'm trying my best to because I knew when we, my, we came to this country because we know my parents knew we couldn't go to school in, the, in Côte d'Ivoire because we wouldn't have the same future. That's a colonized perspective. But they were actually right. <laughs> I wouldn't be who I was today if I had stayed in Côte d'Ivoire. And I hate that for me. And so it's this constant battle of contradictions that is what France Fanon talks about, the, that disorienting altar that we constantly fill with white supremacist shit. Like if, if we have an altar, I don't know if y'all know altar, it's like where you kind of, you can pray to, you can put your ancestors, you can like give offerings. Our altar sometimes is like Ivy League institutions, six-figure jobs, um, this and this and this. And it's like, man, my altar looks real, it's giving white supremacy here. And all we can do is start replacing those items slowly. Like actually, I'm gonna take out the need to be a, an executive director somewhere and replace, like, I would like to grow weed in the woods. That's cool, you know? Like, that's a way for me to start decolonizing myself. Um, anywho, I'm pontificating, so I'll stop there, but I, it's such a lifelong journey that can only be disrupted by ourselves making that active decision to be real, to be our real selves. But we can talk more about it. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for coming to speak. I really appreciated your sort of disarming authenticity. Thank um, you. It's Ooh, very disarming authenticity. <laughs> Write that down, Cha. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you because um, you spoke a lot about the sort of international development work, and a lot of that kind of brings to mind for me, and I'm sure a lot of other people, when it comes to like cooperating with governments in other countries. And I think a lot of the times, a lot of the time we hear about the like, corruption in other countries. Um, and I think when you hear about it in the US, you feel more like, well, I can, I can run for office. I can join the government. And a lot of people have this idea that like, oh, I can change the system, mm -hmm. even though a lot of people end up kind of being swallowed by the system. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I just wanted to get your perspective on when you're going to work in another country and the government becomes an issue or like a barrier to supporting these communities or, you know, kind of handing off the, um, like when the government is participating in that colonization with you of mm. those their own people, like yeah. how do you approach trying to be better about that? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a big one, and I a part of my career was working with governments, um, but it was very local. I say the the more local you can get, the easier it is to find community act. At, like actors who are almost more important than the government. I think, at least in the African context, what I found is there's policy on a big scale that oftentimes on the continent or in Sub-Saharan Africa is an amalgamation of very rich donors, country donors, just random billionaires. There's just so many people who are on the big scale the, the big stage. And I I don't know if that's something you'd be interested in. I knew that wasn't for me. And so I actually went kind of, I didn't do Peace Corps, but I went the Peace Corps route of like hyper local in the beginning of my career. So that's my context. And almost that felt like very untouched by the government. You know, when you are in smaller communities, like I said, community actors and honestly religious um, leaders are almost more important than the government sometimes. So maybe keep that in mind. I, I think on a larger scale, what you'll be working with is a lot of donors too, and if you're okay with that. Um, so, but also consider like hyper-local also. Yeah, I hope that's useful. Hi, thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, this was an amazing you. presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so f I don't know like how much you know about like what we have to do, but for uh, each of us, we have to do like group projects to kind of like talk about like issues globally. And one thing that I know like my I saw group, one about f space food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That one. <laughs> So I know for like my group, like we've been really struggling trying to figure out because like our topic also has to do with like indigenous group and trying to figure out ways to like kind of keep true to like 
what might they might the community would want versus like what would be like a realistic global sol- solution. So mm-hmm. I guess like this presentation like kind of made me realize like we might be coming at it from maybe a more like colonist lens, like, oh, like, well, how can we solve this issue? Or how can, mm-hmm. like, as, like, a global, like, solution that can kind of, like, help this community? So I guess, mm-hmm. like, what do we do in that situation where it's, like, we might want to, like, stay true to the community, but it might not be, like, realistic on, like, a global scale? Oh, well, I mean, you have to decide if you're going to buy into that, right? Um, but, I f- yeah, I, I feel like... Yeah, I mean, you just, you have to decide if that is the type of work you want to do. There, there's so many ways to make an impact in international affairs. And if you go back to the doula analogy, I think it's really thinking through what's my best chance of showing up in this way. It could be that in every one of your projects, each of you has to actually build in community engagement, like before even something happens. And so, I mean, I think, when I think about all my clients I've worked with, like CARE, Save the Children, these different huge NGOs, what they were missing was a community engagement layer. They would go straight from DC development of an intervention to, if there were if they're working in Kenya, the Kenyan people in DC, <laughs> and then they implement, right? Where I, I I've been arguing for a few years that there's this additional layer of not community serving and making it really like laborious for the community, but what's the easiest way to understand how we can be helpful. So same with doulas, you come in and you have to kind of quietly, without disrupting this birthing person, analyze the situation. Because you don't want to disrupt them. They're having a baby. (laughs) You don't want to be like, hey girl, did you eat? Did you, are you okay? Wait, where are the sheets? It's like, okay, don't disrupt me, I'm birthing. So you quietly come in, you do an analysis. Okay, the sheets are here, the doctor's here, woo, 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 doop, doop, doop. And that's what you get trained on as a doula, is to be the least disruptive when somebody's doing something hard. When they call you in, it's like, get me my fucking ice. It's like, okay, you get in there and you get them their ice. But I think before all that, it's dismantling the ego and being like, I am only gonna be helpful here. And if you had that mentality with your group project, I think the beginning steps might look different. It could look like creating a council of advisors at the local university who might be look, working on the same thing. Um, it might look like finding funding for a woman-led organization in that space to do a little analysis for you and compensating them to support you in this work. Um, yeah, if you think like a doula, you probably will never miss that step. Thank you so much, and thank you for the compliment. It warms my heart. Thank you. Okay, great. So with the, uh, oh. I'll ask a question. Yes, okay. so you talked, you talked a lot about contradictions, and um, in, in your work, when have you decided to lead and when to follow? And how do you mm-hmm. find that balance for yourself? Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm a, I'm a leader. I don't think I ever lead. I think I'm asked to clarify things. I, I come in and repackage information. I add additional context. I'm trying to think in my career if I've ever been that type of leader. I usually, I mean, doulas aren't leaders either, you know? They're not leading anything. They're really in the background supporting, and I think I'm mostly like that. Um, And it's probably, you know, I'm not like, (laughs) I didn't grow up the most ambitious person. (laughs) Like, I told a few of y'all I, like, wasn't a great student. I wasn't like, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to achieve all these things. And I think that kind of helped me because I've been able to comfortably sit in a position where I'm always mobilizing resources, whether it's I'm supporting a birthing person or I'm supporting a philanthropist or I'm supporting 
at my Buddhist Sangha or I'm at my community garden, I'm usually like thinking of myself in a doula capacity. And But I love to see leaders. I love to see them. I think they, in international development, I can say the best leaders I've seen are black women and femmes because, I'm biased, child, but because of how internalized and how deeply they understand what it looks like for people not to stand in solidarity with them. And unfortunately, recently, a lot of black women have been stripped of their uh, positions at the helm of different institutions. But I do think leaders emerge from understanding the issue. And so, although I understand a lot of issues I can recognize for myself, I'm more of a doula, if that makes sense, Nina. Thank you. Love to see you up front. Another question? Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to rain on your parade of the next topic of the reflection. I hope we can do that after. But I just had a question that came up. Um, I loved your presentation as well. Thank you so much. Um, so my question was, um, if there is like a very, um, it's very clear that like colonialism is deeply rooted in a lot of existing tensions that happen in a lot of countries with the example of like apartheid um, in several countries. So in that, in those instances, like what role should those colonial powers have in, um, I guess like reducing those tensions? Like should they serve, like who should be involved in the process of like solving a lot of those issues that come about that are deeply rooted in the like colonial um, influences that caused those issues and those like tensions between the people, how should that process go about and like what role should they have while also like preserving the autonomy of the people who live in those countries and those territories? Yeah, I mean in the ideal world, okay. In the real world, no one who is oppressing someone and is okay with destroying their communities, killing their, the people in those communities, they're not going to be on board with fixing the issue, usually, traditionally. Um, so I don't, think I, have a, I don't think I have a realistic answer. Because in the perfect world, there would be a real recognition of the harm that the state plays in apartheid, in genocide, in killing people, um, in destroying and disrupting their lives. But that's, it's never the state who is going to support the liberation of that. Um, I'm gonna leave it there, but I want to think more. I want to give you a more thoughtful answer. And I, I have so many things in my mind. You've triggered so many things <laughs> with that question. But yeah, can you give me some more time to think through that? Um, I feel an emotional place because of that question. And I don't want to pontificate in, in, in a circular way. But I, I mean, first, it's that this, I don't think we should consider any state as an actor in reconciliation. But I also know that is really pessimistic for me to say. Um, what I do believe in is effective philanthropy, which looks like truly moving money with no boundaries, no um, caveats, no, there are certain philanthropists and philanthropic institutions who are moving massive amounts of money to people who need it, no questions asked. I think those infusion, that infusion of money supports the real actors, which are the locally engaged people, maybe the religious leaders, may, a lot of women leaders, being, resourcing them to think through next steps is what we've seen has worked the best. Um, I, there's a great case study on it in Liberia on what happened when you infused women's groups with cash money for them to do what they wanted to do during the war and right after the war in Liberia. So I can send that also. But I want to think through that more. Um, and maybe I can write to you. Because that's, that's the question. That's a really, that's a big question.
Okay. Have a question? Do we have time? It's okay if we don't. Yeah, we have time. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, we have time. Um, I just wanted to <laughs> echo again, thank you, especially as a toddler mom, for taking the time out today to come here and, and talk to us. Um, yeah. This is sort of, I guess, I don't know if I have this question perfectly formed in my mind, but being here at Wellesley and you speaking to us and you said you had taught at uh, Georgetown, how do you reckon with everything you just talked to us about and your amazing perspective and also everything that these schools represent. I guess even personally, I think of going back to my own community and obviously it's an extreme privilege to be here and everybody sort of asks like, how did you do it? And it feels like it's their goal as well. And sort of how would I sit there knowing that it is a privilege and ideally it's my family's path towards financial freedom and say like, maybe it's not the end all be all. Maybe there's so much more in our lives than coming to Wellesley College or to America or being educated here, I guess. I hope that made sense. You answer the question. That's it. There, there has to be more, <laughs> and we have to communicate that. But it's the constant contradictions. It's hard, it's hard to feel confident in saying that because it, it feels like a contradiction. I think that people of color, women of color, we we can only talk about these things if we accept that we are walking contradictions. I have to accept that I, I, I teach at Georgetown, I work for certain people, and I want to actively break these systems down. And I don't proselytize about joining these systems. It's, re it's, it's really tough, but it's the honesty. It's the um, disarming authenticity, you know? It's like being real that this is a means to an end. My work in philanthropy is the least interesting and important thing about me. My work in international development is the least important, interesting, colorful thing about me. And it's, it's just stripping some of the power away in whatever way you think is right for you. And that statement might be the right statement for you to continue to tell people. But I, I, I just want you to know it's okay to be a contradiction. I'm a contradiction. A lot of us in here are sitting with really tough contradictions, and that's why colonization is so detrimental because we can't even be fucking normal, you know? <laughs> we can't even just say, this is who I am fully, and I'm, I've removed all of the other things. Because I can't remove the other things. I won't pay my mortgage, right? And so can the contradictions be an entry point for engagement of communities, for engagement of young people who are in your life asking you how you got to Wellesley. Um, can, can, it be a, can it be like a soft landing place for you to be real with someone? Um, I hope that's what I created here with each of you, and I think each of you could do that with someone else too. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you so How? What's your baby's name? Oh, no, sorry. I was saying thank you for coming. No, no. What Do you have? Oh, you don't have a toddler. Oh. I was saying thank you for taking oh, your time. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I have a baby girl. For a second, that that's what came across, but I didn't want to say I acknowledge it. Oh, no. You don't have to worry. Babies are fun at all ages. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for the props. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry, I'll... <laughs> um, yeah, um, like, as a black woman, it's like a walking contradiction. I'm at Wellesley College. I went natural with my hair, but I'm changing it for an interview tomorrow. Like, oh! Yeah. I'm putting it into a fro, though, so, like, oh. it's... Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess, like, how do you take care of your, like, mental health being mm. a walking contradiction? Oh. Man. Okay. Wow. What a qu How do you? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll start. Um, yeah. I, I, again, I, I, I've never been too attached to my career. Um, I think, honestly, I've been living life off vibes for a few decades, but I think that I've said this to a few of you in this room. Um, your mission is probably clear. The container can change. 
Like for me, my mission is to mobilize resources for black women and femmes and queer folk. I can do it at the Gates Foundation. I don't give a fuck if it changes. I can do it again at my Buddha Center. I could start, you know, doing it at the community garden. Like I know what mobilizing resources for black folks looks like, so I can do it wherever I am. And that's allowed me to take the pressure off of like this career escalator that I think y'all's generation for sure, like what is this, Gen, X, G, Gen Z? Yeah, y'all don't play, child. Y'all are real, like, I mean, in 2005, again, we were like, that, what time does the SAT start? Like, I'm not, I, I, I want y'all not to feel stressed about your careers, but to feel clear about your mission. And that mission can be contained in so many different things, in so many different places. Um, your work is not going to be the most important thing about you. And that helps with my mental health because I think, again, all the, the components of myself that I put up in the beginning um, are really like, they're, they're, there's a hierarchy here, you know? Like there's things that are real, like that pay me, then there are things that make me feel happy every day. Um, and Buddhism allows me to understand that the internal circumstances of my mind is the only thing I can control and the external circumstances, I'm like vibes, like okay. Like I was like, I might not make it this morning, child. Like I hope this plane is not delayed because I got 20 minutes or so to get here. And it's like I had to detach from that expectation and I think all of you have to detach from your expectations. Like you have missions, you have things you're interested in, you can't be too attached to the path that's gonna get you there. Um, or you're gonna burn yourself out. I've burned myself out, it's not fun, it's scary. Um, it makes you feel like you're not worthy of things. It makes you feel like you should stop. Burnout is not what you wanna to get to. Um, and so it's really important for y'all just to keep clarity on your mission and like everything else is gonna be, is gonna find you because of the mission. And so that's first step of mental health is um, I'm, not, I'm not an overly ambitious person with my career. <laughs> I'm, I am uncompromising about my mission though. And, um, and yeah, I smoke weed, I play with my kid, I only work twice a week, but I've gotten to the point in my career where I don't have to do, have you seen the Beyonce movie? She's like, I don't gotta do shit no more. Mm -hmm. I don't have to say shit, show up nowhere, that's your girl. I don't have to do shit. I show up places because I really wanna see the black people in the space and because I wanna make an impact, but like, you will get to a point in your career where you can, you can be that way, but it's not through burning yourself out. Um, and so I hope that's useful. Yeah, acupuncture, things of this nature. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and you look great with your hair. You have locks now? Um, I just have twists for now. Okay. Maybe locks in the future. Come on, somebody. <laughs> great, okay. So, I think where I gotta send this to you guys, because this is like really important to read every day, um, like the Bible. And so just as we close up, can y'all update your term, I mean your sentence, decolonizing international development means what for y'all now? And would, would anyone be open to sharing the before and after? Um, thank you so much again for coming to speak to us. It's mm. been an honor. Mm. Um, so initially I had written inclusion slash integration. Mm. Um, and I think for me it was just based on some of the conversations we've been having on how it's very vital to include the community mm -hmm. in the decision making. Um, but now it's a sentence and not one word. Yeah. Um, but I've written decolonizing international development means understanding the position slash role I play in in respect to how I am perceived in the community I'm serving. Wow. 
Yeah. So, yeah. I love that. Oh, snaps. Y'all snap here. <laughs> oh, of course, at Wellesley, y'all snap. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. That is so powerful because it, it's, it's a personal mission. That's a personal lens you can put, you can share with others if they want to also take that on, but it, that can be something you keep forever. I love that. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Anyone else? If you haven't noticed, there are no wrong answers. I love everything. So feel free. Um, before I had decolonizing international development means working for the people who actually live on the land. Mm -hmm. And then like afterwards, I just changed it to working with the people instead of for the people. And I think like it's just like realizing like you're not just coming in like rescuing them or even mm -hmm. like not rescuing them, but you're not coming in and like coming up with a solution. Yeah. Like they have the solution already. You're just like a cog yeah. to like help them like be there for them. Yes. Wow. That one change. That was a one word change. And that, that's like a great case study of what you'll see in international development when you're tasked with creating a scope of work or a memorandum of agreement with a community or it, it's that one word and that could be your activism. If you're working for, you know, uh, save the children and they're like, hey, we're gonna go and work, what was the first word? for the community and you literally are like, let's change this one word, that's activism. That's your, that's your role, that's your dharma, that's your reason of being there is one word. Because you'll see these words are so important. <laughs> they really color the whole intervention. And so I, I, I don't want you to take what you just did lightly. That was a big deal. Thank you. Oopsies. Okay, anyone else want to share? Okay. Um, thank you again for yeah. your talk, it was amazing. Um, so originally I had decolonizing international development means uh, dismantling global systems of hierarchy that hold back previously colonized um, nations, but then I added like giving platforms to people that are in these communities mm -hmm. and um, taking less of a like paternalistic role. Yes, yes, paternalistic, ugh. I mean, your original definition was pretty spot on, child, so that's great, <laughs> just adding. <laughs> Wonderful, well, thank you. I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Thank you so much.